Well, good evening. There's been a lot said recently about the senseless killing of George Floyd by the Minnesota police officer. And uh, I don't know what else to add to that, but some scripture. So uh, I want to read a scripture, and this would be my comment on what is needed in this hour. From Romans 12, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. If we could do that at this particular time, I think that would solve a lot of our problems. I want to go and finish my remarks today by sharing the last three books of my 10 most influential and impactful books. Again, they're, they're not the 10 best books in Christianity or even my 10 favorite necessarily, but just 10 that really impacted and changed my life. I have two on the topic of marriage that I want to share with you. The first one is called The Mystery of Marriage by Mike Mason. This is such a tremendous book. It's my favorite book on the theology of marriage. And it's just so well written. So many beautiful paragraphs that just inspire you in marriage. I just selected a few uh, paragraphs from the book just to kind of whet your appetite if you're interested in this topic. The first paragraph comes from your spouse is always there. A marriage or a marriage partner may be compared to a great tree growing right up through the center of one's living room. It is something that is just there. It is huge and everything has been built around it. And wherever one happens to be going, to the fridge, to bed, to the bathroom, or out the front door, the tree has to be taken into account. It cannot be gone through. It must be respectfully gone around. It is somehow bigger and stronger than oneself. True, it could be chopped down, but not without tearing the house apart. And certainly it is beautiful, exquisite, unique, exotic, but also, let's face it, it is at times an enormous inconvenience. Page 50 is another neat paragraph. Or rather, once it has caught us, for marriage is a trap. It is a trap of pure love. The love is so pure, so intense, that it can be like a big iron gate that clangs shut behind us. And there we are, imprisoned of our own free will in the dungeon of marriage. And the one and only key has been handed over to our partner, a total stranger, to swallow. I'll read one more. This is waking up with your spouse of a morning. And he's talking about the beautiful outdoor setting and where they live. And he talks about, this is the scene I wake up to every morning here where I live, to the accompaniment of one of those frothing silver blue rushing mountain rivers whose sound fills my ears the way the dawn light fills my eyes. And yet, even that is not all. There is something else, something more breathtaking than any of these other stupendous and beautiful things and even more radiant with light. There is a woman in bed beside me. Right now, this moment, I could reach out my hand and touch her as easily as I touch myself. And as I think about this, it is more staggering than any mountain or moon. It is even more staggering, I think, than if this woman happened instead to be an angel, which, come to think of it, she might well be. There are only two factors which prevent the situation from being so overpoweringly awesome that my heart would explode just to take it in. One is that I have woken up just like this, with this same woman beside me hundreds of times before, and the other is that millions of other men and women are waking up beside each other, just like this, each day and every day all around the world and have been for thousands of years. I just love the, the beauty and simplicity 
of Mike Mason's writing. The next book on marriage is called Love and Respect by Emerson Egeridge. And it's different from Mason's book, and it's not as flowery. It's your practical how-tos about marriage. It's the best one that I've read on how can I improve my marriage? What, what should I do? And basically, it boils down to Paul's admonition in Ephesians 5.33, telling the husbands to love their wives and for the wife to see to it that she respects her husband. Hence the title of the book, Love and Respect. If the husband would truly love his wife, like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and the wife would truly respect her husband, and Egridge gives lots of practical ways to put that into practice, it would revolutionize their marriage. Love and Respect, very practical, solid book on marriage. And, and the final book of 10, and I may sh continue this series and share 10 more, is Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. Now, I know Rick Warren has kind of uh, gone off the deep end a little bit theologically, but way back in the day, I, I think he, he had a lot of good stuff to say. And this book is famous for its first line, it's not about you. It all starts with God the Purpose Driven Life. Uh, I've read through this book, used this book in small groups, did preaching series on it. It's just, it was a, it was a book that definitely changed things for me in that part of my life. So I think it's an excellent uh, book and an excellent read. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy at this point. Okay, so I'm the tree in the living room mm -hmm. that Ed can't even go to the, um, not the garage, the refrigerator without moving around me. Mm -hmm. Okay, no no sensitivity here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to uh, walk through, I think, what a few of us have walked through the last few days. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I think what we're trying to do here is, you know, just maybe an intended audience for this and, you know, whether it ever reaches them, um, you know, just trusting that if there's a few um, nuggets of wisdom that God has given in our life, that it'll find the right people at the right time. So that's my um, prayer and trust in, in what we're trying to do here. Um, so I knew generally that there were, were riots happening, um, but we had a, a few ladies over um, Sunday night, and one of them had you know, really kind of seen Richmond and saw a boarded up Whole Foods. And, you know, so all of a sudden, like kind of like this sinister wave kind of just like, oh, wow. And so, you know, the evening ended and it seemed like just three things almost boom, boom, boom. It's like, oh, like something's coming your way. It could be actually affecting the church. And so just like this kind of imminent, um, pending sense. So it was interesting. And I, even though I said to one of the people that called us, it's like, you know, we really need to cry out to God for this. But it was just interesting to watch Ed and I, he and I, he raced toward one thing and I raced towards the other. And neither one of them was calling out to God in prayer. And mine was, um, let, I need to let out of town relatives and friends know to pray for us. But the thing was, it's like when you're all stirred up, why don't you run to God? Is there something about our emotions stirred up that keeps us from prayer? And I just knew in the back of my mind, this, this scripture just kept, like, I, mean, I could just hear it. And I found it the next morning, 1 Peter 4, 7, 7. For the culmination of all things is near. So be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of prayer. And if you kind of move backwards with that, to be able to pray requires some amount of being self-controlled and sober-minded. I'm just going to give a few definitions in there. The culmination, the end, 
the limit at which a thing ceases to be. I mean, I hear people, Christian, non-Christian, seeming to be talking about this right now. Self-controlled of a sound mind, one's right mind, sober, to be collected, temperate, dispassionate, circumspect. So when something is stirring, is entering your ears and it's making you either dash towards social media or that there there is a way to calm down our hearts to be in a place that so for the sake of prayer and I, I mean I saw one thing that I mean and, and I think these work first Thessalonians 5 8 so then we must not sleep as the rest but we must stay alert and sober, which in some ways seem like they're contradictory. If you're staying alert, you're going to know what's going on, and that could stir you up. But since we are of the day, we must stay sober by putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, our hope of salvation. So faith, faith calms us down. Faith is like the shield. I, so Ed shared, and I'm not going to mention the book I'm getting this from, but this is something I, I think I will keep with me the rest of my life. And again, these are the things I think we're wanting to share on Wednesdays is these are life tested lessons for us. Okay. So Matthew 8, 24, a great storm developed on the sea so that the waves began to swamp the boat, but he was asleep. So if, you know, anything I'm going to share here, you can say, well, that's, that's not really immediate, relevant, urgent, eminent. Well, waves coming into your boat is going to sink you. Um, I don't know, rioters coming your way is going to come your way. These are things that are uh, like there's a time sensitive element in them. So definitely being out at sea and time with each passing moment, more water is getting in the boat and Jesus is asleep. So I'm going to read a uh, little bit here. But Jesus is at peace. How can he be at rest in the midst of such a terrible threat? When you cry out in fear, he rises and looks out at that storm, totally unconcerned. Why are you afraid, he asks. Has he gone mad? Does he not see the reason to fear? Does he not see, and then they mention things about marriage, and but we could say, doesn't he see the virus, and there can continue to be positive tests, and we're dealing with it locally and personally in some issues. Uh, we've got the virus, we got uh, unsettledness um, that's playing out even these days. Um, we have, what, a hurricane, tropical storm. We have the, the words of, will the virus come back in the fall? Um, tensions with the political stuff. So does he not see the reason to fear? Doesn't he not see this unless... And this is the key part. What he sees and what you see are not the same. And what does he see instead of the storm? He sees another dimension in which you are complete and safe and glorified, not subject to harm or fear in any way. He sees the Father who offers no judgment nor condemnation. He sees life and joy and love and peace in an eternal union with his father manifesting now on earth in the most spectacular fashion as we place our faith in him he sees peace in the storm and so can we his question is still the same today why are you afraid O oh, you of little faith so, you know, I'm already, you know, hearing and wondering, are we, are we kind of entering the birth pangs and it, are these just some initial pangs? Well, if we're so stirred up, we can't pray. Is Jesus going to, is the son of man going to find faith on this earth? I think we need 
to get into what Jesus was seeing in that storm and unconcerned about that storm. Um, you know, a wonderful verse in John 16, says, you in me, you will have peace. Um, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. There's so much in that. And the Jesus that was on the boat in the storm is the same Jesus who is ever living to intercede for us. I think I'm okay. So the thought was, how do you learn to pray when you're so stirred up by threats? We're all in a process of finding ourselves in Christ who very well knew the storm, but he all the more knew the reality that he was seeing. And we, we need to be in that process of going there, especially if birth pangs are increasing. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Kathy. So it's fitting that we would pray. And let's pray right now. Well, Jesus, you are in the boat with us, as it were. You're right here, close, in the storm we're going through globally with a pandemic, which is impacting our country. And then, of course, all of the turmoil, the rioting and looting and protesting that's going on and destruction of property and such division and um, unhappiness and injustice, so many things, Lord. We need you. Lord, you're able to give peace in the midst of all that chaos, and we can find that rest in you. Let us uh, dive deep into you and our faith at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. See you next time.